let me just give a, a sort of brief summary of the book um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it and haven't read it. Um, the Away Game tells the story of the largest talent search in soccer history, uh, which was carried out over the last 10 years by the wealthy desert kingdom of Qatar. Um, over that period, they held tryouts for over 5 million 13-year-old boys, um, mostly in Africa, looking for soccer's next superstars. Um, it was led by a Spanish scout who helped launch Lionel Messi's career at Barcelona. And uh, the process was over a 1,000 times more selective than getting into Harvard. Um, so it was an incredible story. It was one that uh, I really took to uh, when I first heard about it. And that was um, back in 2007 when the program first started. Mm -hmm. I was living in Cairo, uh, actually saw a commercial on TV for this gleaming new sports academy in Qatar called Aspire. Uh, did a bit of Googling, and it just so happened that um, that was when they launched this program, which is called Football Dreams. And uh, so I went over um, when the first class of kids from Africa were in Doha for their final tryout, um, wrote a story about it for the AP. And even then, I thought it would be an amazing book or documentary or movie or something, but wasn't really in a position to do it at the time. And years passed. I moved to Islamabad, as you mentioned, and spent a bunch of time uh, having great adventures and betting with troops in Afghanistan and, and uh, with rebels in Libya. But football dreams sort of always stayed with me. I always wondered what happened to those talented African kids who I had spent a few days with um, years ago. And so at the beginning of 2014, I decided to quit my job, uh, took a leap of faith, and spent the next four years traveling all over the world uh, researching and writing the mm -hmm. story. And how did you get introduced to the scout? Who was Joseph? Uh, yeah, Joseph Colomer. Uh, he's the former youth director at Barcelona. Um, he's the one who helped launch uh, Messi's career. Um, Messi was 16 when, when Joseph took over there. And he uh, promoted Messi four levels in one year, which is something that had never happened at the academy before. And he's the one who gave Messi his debut on the first team. Um, I first met Joseph uh, back in the beginning of 2008 when I went to Doha. Uh, for my uh, for that story about the program uh, at the beginning, uh, and he's a he's a really interesting character. He comes from this medieval town north of Barcelona, and has been obsessed with finding the next generation of soccer talent. Even when he was a teenager, he had a little futsal club uh, there in his little local town, and would spend his weekends kind of canvassing the local towns around him, trying to find the best futsal players. And so eventually made it all the way to Barcelona. He helped Brazil win the World Cup in 2002. So he's an interesting character. Mm -hmm. So the framework of the book follows three kind of aspiring professionals. How did you decide on those three? How many players did you research and end up talking to to really nail down your, your story? Yeah, it was a difficult process trying to choose which players to focus on. As you mentioned, I focus on three African kids uh, who were found about 10 years ago, two from Senegal, one from Ghana, and tell the story of, of, of where they came from, how they were found, um, and what happened to them when they were selected for this program. And, you know, it was difficult to choose which players to focus on because so many of them had incredible stories. I mean, these were all kids who grew up playing on, on dirt fields across Africa, you know, often barefoot or in plastic sandals, um, dreaming that someday some foreign scout would show up on the sideline and, and point to them and say, you're marked for greatness. And so you can imagine you know, their joy and surprise when uh, this Spanish scout shows up, who's worked for one of the biggest clubs in the world, and says he's going to take them to a country they've never heard of before, Qatar, uh, and make all their dreams come true. And so, um, but, but in the end, I, I, held, tr I um, held interviews with over two dozen of the boys wow. in the program. And, uh, I wanted to choose players who um, had interesting stories but different stories so that they would be very distinct for a reader. Um, and the three boys I chose, Bernard, um, Diwandu, and Ibrahima, they come from different backgrounds. Um, and also they had different trajectories. Uh, they had different outcomes. Um, one of them, I don't want to give it away, but one of them made it all the way to Barcelona where he was playing with Messi and Neymar and Suarez. Um, the others sort of had uh, different levels of success. And I, that was very important for me, to not just tell the story of the boys who made it, mm -hmm. but also the ones who didn't. Because you realize that the percentage of players who actually uh, make it all the way to the top clubs is infinitesimally small. I mean, at the 
Premier League academies in the UK, the percentage of players who make it from the youth level to the first team is a half a percent. Wow. And these are kids who are already in the best academies in the world. So you think about a kid who, who grows up playing on you know, a dirt field in Africa, what's his percentage chance? It's really small. And so I wanted to also tell the story of those kids who, who fans never really hear about, the names of the players they never really learn. So let's talk a little bit about that percentage. And a lot of the big part of the book in, in the scouting process was physical skills versus the data analytics. Um, and you're really scouting players that have you no know, video footage on them and a lot of information uh, to, to base your decision off of. What did you see was how they were scouted and, and what were they looking for in these players to bring them to the academy? Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things I do in the book is I weave in a discussion of the science of searching for soccer talent. Um, there's been a lot of research in the last 15 to 20 years about what makes a great player and what scouts should be looking for when they're scouting young kids. And the interesting thing, as you mentioned, is that they shouldn't be focused on physical characteristics. You know, things like size, strength, and speed really aren't going to tell them about a player's potential. Speed's probably the most useful of those variables, but even speed's not really going to tell you that much. Um, technique is more important, but the most important factors are actually the mental ones. Um, things like game intelligence, vision, personality. Uh, and game intelligence was the most interesting one to me. When I asked uh, Joseph first, or when I first met him, you know, what do you look for in a player? When you go and you're standing on the sidelines of a field in Nigeria and you're watching a bunch of 13-year-old kids run around, what are you looking for? And he said, I look for the player who understands the game, who understands what the game is asking. Mm -hmm. He said, there are plenty of players who can dribble, there's plenty of players who can shoot. But plenty of players, when the game is asking them to dribble, they shoot. When the game is asking them to pass, they dribble. He said, but there's certain players who always make the right, the right decisions. And he likes to point to Andre Iniesta, who's this sprightly midfield genius who, for his whole career until just now, played for Barcelona. You know, he likes to say that uh, Iniesta isn't big, he's not fast, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a good dribbler, but not the best. He doesn't score goals, but he always makes the right decisions. And so he was looking for that game intelligence. Uh, and interestingly enough, although he, Joseph himself didn't know the science behind it. There's been a bunch of research into game intelligence. And what they found was that in children, game intelligence develops not so much through formal games and practice, but through pickup soccer, through the kind of street soccer that these kids in Africa and South America play so much of. And so he intuitively knew that if he went to a place like Africa, that there were a lot of kids with that raw talent that he was looking for. And it was interesting to see that the research actually backed that up. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the academy. Uh, a lot of investment went into the academy, but it's kind of an interesting dynamic on timing. And it seems like they were kind of had two routes for the players, either to go get them to become a professional when they turned 18, or it seemed like to play for a national team. Mm -hmm. Did you get a sense that with the timing of the 2022 uh, World Cup, and the age being kind of the right fact that that might have played a little piece into them wanting to play for the Qatar national team? Yeah, so that actually it did, that ended up playing into it somewhat. But the program actually started before uh, Qatar decided to bid for the World Cup. Um, and the background to the program is, is that it starts with one of the richest men in the world, um, a guy named Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani, uh, who's a member of the Qatari royal family. And he decided nearly 20 years ago that he was going to make it his mission to produce a world-class Qatari national team. Um, in fact, he was so passionate about soccer that uh, he was heir to throne at the time of Qatar. He gave that up to his brother and sort of threw himself into this project wholeheartedly. Wow. And, and the first thing he did was he spent a billion dollars and he built Aspire Academy, which is um, possibly the most high-tech sports academy in the world. Uh, the signature feature of Aspire is the largest air-conditioned sports dome in the world, which is the width of the Eiffel Tower laying on its side. So it's absolutely massive. You can imagine what it was like for these African kids when they showed up for the first time uh, in, in uh, Doha after running around on dirt fields and then seeing this massive dome. Um, so even though Qatar only had a few hundred thousand citizens, which is a, you know pretty tough to think about producing a world-class national team, he had money to spend, he wanted to do it. So he, he spent a billion dollars, he built Aspire, um, he hired all the best scouts and coaches, 
And the first thing they did was uh, held tryouts for every boy in Qatar. Because you can do that if you only have a few hundred thousand citizens. Quickly realized they didn't have the population necessary to produce a world-class national team. And that's when they ended up launching Football Dreams. He connected with Joseph Colomero, who'd been at, at Barcelona. And they set off. They actually invited Pele over in 2007 to launch the program. Um, and th th their stated purpose for doing this was just, well, they wanted to go find players in Africa who were much better than the players in their academy so that those African players could train with their local players and improve the level of training, uh, which would make the local players better. But Qatar has a long history of using its wealth to lure foreign athletes into taking Qatari citizenship and competing for the country on the world's highest stage. They've done it for Kenyan sprinters, Bulgarian weightlifters, uh, my personal favorite, a Chinese chess grandmaster. Um, and so I think at the beginning of the program, uh, they, they had this idea that um, they would go find the best of the best in Africa, bring them, uh, give them Qatari citizenship, and they would um, play for Qatar. Uh, and eventually, once that they won the right to host a World Cup, that became even more important. But as the book describes, it didn't exactly play out as they had planned. So it became a more complicated endeavor than they imagined. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that this is one of the top you know, world-class uh, facilities. What was that like for the first group that came over that, as you mentioned, played on dirt? Um, a lot of them didn't have cleats. Uh, and coming into just this incredible facility, what was that transition like to just the day-to-day -day life and then also the, the ability to train at such a higher level? Yeah, I mean, again, it was staggering for them to, to show up for the first time at Aspire. I mean, one of my favorite quotes in the book is Diwan Du, one of the players I focus on, who's this uh, defender from Senegal. The first time he walks into the dome, he says, you know, even if I don't make it, I want to be buried here. You know, I mean, it was just like nothing he could have ever imagined. And so these kids, you know, they had to adjust to that. I mean, these are kids that many had never had you know, hot water showers before or never been in an elevator, you know, things like that, which for us, you know, are pretty commonplace. But for them, it was a totally new experience. And, and it took some time to adjusting to that. Um, but they had to adjust because they needed to focus on what was going to happen on the field, which was they were about to be put into a tryout with uh, the elite from the, of the elite from the rest of Africa. And in order to, to have any hope of staying at the academy, they really needed to perform. And so there was a lot of pressure on them. You know, a lot of these kids, um, they came from pretty poor families. And so, you know, their, their families saw soccer and saw them as the best ticket to sort of a better life. And, and so it was a lot of pressure on, on them at a young age. Mm -hmm. And they had some success as a team in the academy. Can you talk through, I know they played the Real Madrid, Barcelona, some of the best European teams in the uh, in the world. Can you talk about maybe one of the? I think you highlight in the book one of the, you know, one of the great games and some of the wins that mm -hmm. they had. Um, what was what did you notice and what did you think was kind of the coolest experience for them? Yeah, I mean these kids they sort of blew the soccer world away. You know they would go play at these tournaments. Nobody had ever heard of them. I mean the, the amazing thing about football dreams is even though it's massive, again they held tryouts for five million kids. A lot of folks in the soccer world had never heard about it before. So these kids would show it up at a tournament, you know, and, you know, AC Milan or Barcelona or PSG would be looking at their schedule and saying, oh, we're playing Aspire Academy. Who are these guys? Africa and football dreams. Never heard of them. And then get wiped off the field by them. Uh, I, remember, I remember I was with the uh, coach of the AC Milan's under-16 team at this tournament that's held in Doha every year called the Alcos Tournament, which is one of the biggest youth tournaments in the world. And I saw him watch the, the Football Dreams kids play for the first time, and his jaw just dropped. And he was like, who are these kids? And, uh, but one of my favorite um, stories along those lines was back in 2011, they played in this tournament called the Milk Cup in Northern Ireland, which is, again, one of the biggest tournaments in the world for, for uh, youth teams. And uh, they crushed everyone. And in the final, uh, they beat Manchester United 5-1. to one. And one of the players I focus on, Ibrahima Drame, who's this sort of tall, strapping striker from southern Senegal, scored a hat trick in the final, scored, he was the highest scorer in that tournament as he was many other tournaments he played. And so uh, that, that tournament was very emblematic of, you know, they would go, be totally unknown, and then just wipe all of these major clubs off the field. Wow. Now, there was a lot of money that came into the investment of this. 
do they feel they got a return on, on the uh, academy? I mean, if you ask them whether they thought it was a success, they would say yes, because it's their program. But, you know, they spent upwards of $200 million on this program over a period of 10 years, which sounds like a lot of money to us, but for Qatar actually is not that much money. That maybe is a day of oil and gas revenue for them. Yeah. So it's not, a, it's not a huge investment. I, I think, you know, it depends on what lens you look at the program through. Um, if you look at it on a purely scouting basis, um, you know, they produced some players who made it to big clubs. A lot of their players have played for their youth national teams in Africa. Um, and so you could, you could kind of debate whether or not it was successful. I, I think for that amount of money, you probably would, would have wanted even bigger players to come out of it, but you can debate that. Um, the other thing that they really focus on is they say this was a humanitarian program. Um, they say, you know, we're, our, our focus was to try and help um, kids in Africa who wouldn't get the chance to um, become professionals, top professionals, um, because they don't have the development opportunities at home. I think it's a harder case if you, if you look at it as a humanitarian program. I mean, there were definitely kids whose lives were transformed. But, you know, spending $200 million on what ends up being a very small number of kids. I mean, every year they held tryouts for about 500,000 13-year-old boys, and they chose the top 20. And then from the 20, you know that only a small percentage of those are actually going to succeed because it's so hard to choose which kids at that age are going to be top professionals. And so $200 million on a very small number of people does not necessarily make the greatest humanitarian program. And so I think from that perspective, it maybe doesn't look so great. So you bring up age and, you know, one of my, I think the most interesting parts of the book and personally the part I found fascinating was that there's this question of age and, and about are these kids actually 13? And it seems like you uncovered that in some cases there might not be. Uh, how many players did you notice that the age might not have been true? And then what was the most egregious 13-year-old that, right. you, that you saw? So, yeah, so age cheating is a big problem um, in soccer and youth soccer in Africa. And actually not just in Africa, but other parts of the developing world as well where kids will often say that they're much younger than they are to make it seem like they're better than they are. I mean, imagine putting a high school senior in, in a game with a bunch of elementary school kids, and you can imagine that the high school senior would seem really good, but actually he's just older. And so this is so widespread in Africa that you'll hear coaches you know, talking about a player and they'll say, you know, he's 18, but his football age is 13. Uh, and so I'd heard, I knew conceptually this was a problem, but I spoke to Aspire about it. And they said, oh, yeah, no, we've got it covered. You know, we do our own um, medical scans on the players once they get here to Doha to make sure that they're the right age. And so FIFA, what they use is they do a, a wrist MRI because you have growth plates <coughs> in your wrist. And their scientists say that if the growth plates are fused, there's a 99% chance a player is over 17. So that's what they use at, say, the Under-17 World Cup. Um, and so Aspire told me, you know, we've got it covered. And I thought, okay, well, it's not going to be a problem. And that's a huge leg up for them in then trying to find future stars in Africa. But then I went to Africa for one of my big research trips. I mean, I spent about five months in West Africa in total. And I started getting the sense that these players weren't necessarily the age that they were saying. You know, you'd get comments, you'd hear certain things. Um, and so <laughs> one of the moments for me that really kind of stood out was I was talking to a player named Yobu Tom from the Ivory Coast. And I thought he was gonna be one of the central characters in my book. He has a fascinating story. When he was selected to go to the final tryout in Doha, um, they discovered he had a heart defect. And they, they did surgery on him and he recovered. He became the captain of the under 17 Ivory Coast national team, took them to the World Cup in Mexico. And then at that tournament was lured away by a German agent who promised him glory in Europe, and he ended up having a very difficult time. So I thought, this is an amazing story. He'll be one of my main characters. And so I went to Abidjan to spend a few weeks with him and his family. And so I was talking to him and one of his youth coaches from Abidjan. And the youth coach, I asked the youth coach, so what age was Yobu when you first saw him play? And the youth coach said to me, oh, he was 13. And I turned to Yobu and I said, but wait a minute, weren't you 13 when Aspire came and held tryouts? And he goes, oh, yes, I was also 13 then. <laughs> And so then I thought, okay, well, he's not, he wasn't 13, but what age was he? And it's very difficult to figure out exactly what age these kids are because everyone is trying to deceive you. I mean, they are, their parents are, 
the coaches are, sometimes federation officials are, because they know that they might get a little bit of money if kid makes it. Um, and so somebody told me, the only way to really determine the age is to go to the kid's elementary school and figure out what was the birthday that was written down when the kid started school at the age of five. And so I went to his, his elementary school in Abidjan, and I managed to convince the principal to let me look through these handwritten records that they had. They had this like big stack of handwritten logs that were sort of tattered and dusty. And so I'm flipping through all these, it took me forever. I finally find Yobu Tom, and uh, I kind of get to his birthday, and I do the math in my head, and all of a sudden I kind of like start, and I realize that he wasn't 13 when he tried out for football dreams, he was 21. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've seen pictures of him at the tryout, and he doesn't necessarily look 13, but he doesn't look 21 either. So, you know, the problem was is that the, these European scouts that went and did the, the scouting in Africa, I mean, they knew soccer, they came from Barcelona, they came from Espanol, they came from Atletico Madrid, so these were guys who knew the sport but they'd never really scouted in Africa before. And so they would get sold a bunch of stories by the locals, one of which was, oh, you know, African kids just mature a lot faster than European kids do. Uh, when actually the, the opposite is often true because of malnourishment. African kids on average tend to be smaller than kids in Europe of their same age. But these kids, these scouts didn't really know this, so they would just get sold a bill of goods. And so the players that they were picking were not always as good as they thought they were. Mm -hmm. And there's another kind of piece to that that you kind of brought up, which is they have the local coaches that are really trying to get them to become a professional, professional so they can take a little bit of the money, mm -hmm. a little cut of that. It seems like there's a little bit of an illicit trade happening. Um, do you see that? Was that a big part that you uncovered? And then what do you see the soccer world doing to combat that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge part of that whole industry there. I mean, basically, you'll have these guys who are local coaches I say coaches in, in um, quotation marks because they're not really coaches. They're just local guys from the neighborhood who might have an interest in soccer. Maybe they played a little bit themselves. And they'll sort of prowl the schoolyards looking for the best young kids and buy them at a very young age. Um, and so then they own their registration. They own their license. And so if a club ever wants to take that kid to Europe, they're going to have to buy that license from that coach. Uh, and that can create some really difficult situations because the coach's interests are not always the same as the kid's interests. And one of the players I write about in my book ends up in conflict because of that. And, you know, there's this big problem of this um, sort of illicit trafficking of, of young players from Africa to Europe. Uh, FIFA put in some rules in the, in the last sort of 10 years, 15 years, that said that uh, players aren't allowed to go to, from Africa or anywhere else to Europe uh, until they're 18, because they've been trying to, to cut down on this, although it continues to happen, and there's a lot of stories of kids getting there and either tryouts not appear, uh, materializing or them not making it and end up ending up living on the street, either because they don't have the money to go back or they're so humiliated because their parents spent their whole savings to get them over there um, that they don't want to go back. Um, and so there's been an effort to, to to combat this problem, but it's definitely still a big problem. Mm -hmm. And so part of what it seems like Aspire did to combat that is acquired a Belgium club as a way to have a path for these mm -hmm. players to be professionally. Did you see that that was a successful practice or was everyone still trying to get to the, you know, the big European Barcelona, Madrid type, yeah. type of clubs? Yeah, the acquisition of the Belgian club was one of the most interesting parts of the story because what happened was Joseph Colomer, the, the Spanish scout, he was trying to figure out what do I do with these players when they finish the academy at the age of 18 because it's very difficult for most players to make the jump um, from 18 to a top club. They need more experience at sort of a lower professional level. And so when you're cutter, you just go out and buy a team for the kids. And so they went to Belgium and they bought this little second division club. And it was one of the most fun parts of the, the research process for me because you, know, you can imagine uh, this town of 20,000 people, Oipen, the residents wake up one morning and their local team, the Pandas, is owned by some Middle Eastern country they've never heard of and filled with African teenagers. And so it created quite a bit of turmoil in the town. And so, you know, I went and spent several weeks there. My wife was with me at the time because she speaks French and was able to translate for me. Uh, and it was fun. You know, we walked down the street and, you know, it's the kind of place where after you've been there a week, everyone knows who you are. And so, 
we would walk down the street and they'd be waving us, calling us Mr. and Mrs. Washington, D.C. And, <laughs> and you go into a bar and you can't buy a beer. Like as soon as you sit down, there's one in front of you and they just want to talk about what's going on with the club. One of the local supporters groups boycotted the first year because they didn't agree with Cotter owning the team. Although then they discovered that these African kids were a whole lot better than the players <laughs> that they had before. And so uh, they, they, they did come around. Um, but it, it was, you know, it, it did end up being a good um, jumping off point for some of the kids to bigger clubs in Europe. Um, what ended up being more of a problem is that there was only so much room on this team in Belgium for players. And so they could only take, after the first year when they sent a bunch of the players there, they could only take a few players per year, the absolute best of the academy. And so there were a whole bunch of others who didn't really have uh, an established route into Europe. And so that created a whole lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about where they are they now. Are any of the, I guess, two dozen that you researched, um, how many have made it and are any playing in the upcoming World Cup? So the ones I focus on the book, they aren't at the World Cup. Um, again, they've had varying degrees of success. One made it to Barcelona, one other made it into Europe sort of at a more middle level, and one had, had less success, and that's actually back in Africa. Um, there are a couple players from the program in the World Cup. Uh, this summer, one for Senegal, one for Nigeria. There would have been another one for Nigeria, uh, a player who's very good named Henry Onyakuru, who plays, he's owned by Everton, although he was loaned out to Anderlecht last year. He was the top scorer in the Belgian league the first year he played in the Belgian league. And he'd be in the World Cup this summer, but he hurt his knee. Um, so he's not, not gonna be there. Um, and so uh, I've definitely, I've kept in touch with all of the boys uh, who I write about, uh, the one who, hasn't had much success. I'm actually trying to figure out a way to help him financially. I'm, I'm paying for his kid's school fees right now and trying to help him get a job because soccer really isn't going to work out for him at this point. And so it's, that's the difficult thing is, you know, for me, one of the most impactful parts of the story was the players who didn't make it um, because you see how difficult it is them. They get so close to the sun and then they fall all the way back down to earth. And it can be very difficult for them to figure out how to put their lives back together uh, and find a new path forward. Mm -hmm. And what about the state of aspiring football dreams? Is it still progressing forward? How, how is it today? So they suspended the search at the end of 2016. They said they wanted to evaluate how it's gone to the, for the first 10 years. Um, they're still running the academy uh, both in, in Doha and they also have a satellite academy where they train uh, football dreams kids in Senegal. That's still going. They still have the club in Belgium, um, and so they're still hoping to, to produce future superstars from the program. Mm -hmm. And now that you've written a book on, on soccer, what's your World Cup prediction? <laughs> You're an expert now. Yeah, well, I guess I have this sort of category of what I would like to happen and then what I think would happen. I mean, I'm, I'm a big Messi fan, so I would love to see uh, him win a World Cup. I don't think it's going to happen. Their team is not very good and totally imbalanced. They have amazing strikers. and not much else. Um, you know, I think everyone would love to see Iceland make a run. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Iceland is about the same size as Qatar when you look at the number of citizens. So it's incredible that Iceland produces the stars that it does in Europe and that it's made it into the World Cup. And then another sort of uh, emotional one for me is, um, is Egypt, uh, because I lived in Cairo for three years. And so I, and they've been out of the World Cup for so long that it would be wonderful to see them make a run. I'm hoping Mohamed Salah's shoulder is okay after the Champions League final. Um, and so those are, the, those are my categories of, of who I'd like to win, who I think will actually win. You know, Brazil's very good. Um, Germany's very good. I think it will probably be one of those two. Um, but Belgium is very good. Spain is very good. France is very good. So uh, I think it's going to be a great World Cup. Um, and, you know, I think if it's going to be a Brazil-Germany final, I'd like to see Brazil win. I know it would be a, a kind of collected bit of therapy after the last World <laughs> Cup if they could if they could beat Germany. So, But it'll be fun whatever happens. Great. So getting away from the book, you were a foreign correspondent for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I'm sure you saw some crazy stuff. What's the wildest story you have from your time living overseas? Yeah, I mean, I, it was a lot of crazy times. Again, I spent a bunch of time in Afghanistan, a bunch of time in Iraq. Uh, with the troops, but probably the most insane was I spent a month with the rebels in Libya on the front lines when they were fighting Gaddafi, uh, and it was like Mad Max in the Thunderdome. I mean, these guys, they didn't really have, know what they were doing. 
They'd stripped rocket launchers and anti-aircraft weapons off Soviet attack helicopters and bolted them in the back of pickup trucks and were driving around. You know, they could never bolt the rocket launchers on tight enough. And so when they started firing, the rockets would, it would get loose and the rockets would be firing all over the place. Um, and you'd be out there and all of a sudden, Gaddafi would just start firing artillery at you. And so the desert would just erupt with artillery shells hitting and you'd have to dive in the back of a car and just speed off hoping not to get hit. And so that for me was probably uh, the craziest just because it was so unpredictable. What's up, man? Ricardo, thank you for coming. Definitely going to pick up the book as well. Great, um, thanks. Just one quick comment. Uh, you didn't mention Columbia and your favorites. <laughs> not offended, but keep them on your radar, everyone. Um, one thing that I'm interested in is understanding your perspective in terms of, you know, what kind of role technology can play mm -hmm. in the way, you know, that the game is experienced mm -hmm. in developing worlds in the way like that people are finding talent and stuff like that. Because obviously Google is a technology company first and, and obviously trying to help out, uh, you know, move humanity in the right direction and everything like that. But I'd just be interested to hear like your, your take on, you know, trends that you're seeing and, and ways that you envision technology potentially being able to help things from a, from a football standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting, especially from a, a scouting perspective, what's happening with technology. I mean, obviously everybody's familiar with Moneyball and the sort of revolution in, in data analytics when it comes to sports. Soccer's actually been somewhat of a laggard um, in that category. It's sort of dragged its feet into the data analytics age, but there's definitely been um, progress there you know there's there's a focus on more useful statistics when it comes to games things like expected goals expected assists um, but the problem with a lot of the the technology and the data analytics that's been done in soccer so far is that it was all very ball focused so it was focused on things that happen with the ball whether that be goals or shots or assists or dribbles or tackles but the reality is that 99% of what happens in a game in soccer happens off the ball. And so if you're not taking that into account when you're doing your data analysis, you're basically missing the whole uh, ball game, pun intended. Um, and so what they're starting to do now, because they have so much tracking data of both the ball and the players, they're starting to be able to look at what's happening off the ball, which is incredibly important. And in one of the ways that's most interesting is what I talked about before in terms of game intelligence. You know, the ability to make split second decisions in a dynamic environment is the hallmark of sporting genius in general and very much in soccer. And so they're, they're starting to come up with more sophisticated algorithms using all of this tracking data um, that can spit out basically intelligence scores for players. Are players making the right passes, the right runs, the right dribbles? given not only what's happening on the ball, but the position of all of the players around them. Now, that's only being hap happening at the very top level right now. And even then, it's, it's sort of just starting. And, and there's gonna be, it's going to take some time for, one, them to, to make the algorithms more sophisticated because it's very complex, and also for them to be accepted by kind of scouts and coaches uh, in the sport. But eventually that will happen and eventually the technology will become cheaper so that it will filter down to the youth level. And I, I think it's gonna be fascinating when, when that does happen because I can imagine a scenario where, you know, let's say you recreated this same scouting project uh, some years in the future and you have a Joseph Colomer figure standing on the sidelines who maybe puts a drone in the air that is filming all of the kids and the, the ball as the game is going on that then spits out game intelligence scores to his iPhone and, uh, or his Google phone. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he's able to evaluate right there what he's seeing in front of him. So it'll be interesting to see once we start to be able to, to get quantitative measurements of game intelligence, how much of an impact that has on scouting. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, you slightly mentioned about the kid who went to the academy, but then didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, can you talk about that a little more? Like mm -hmm. what happens with that kids when they return to Africa? Are there any other programs they can take part? Are there any clubs in Africa? Mm -hmm. What happens? Yeah, he, again, he, he, he made it to the academy, but then had to go back uh, to Africa. And unfortunately, it's, it's one of the real weaknesses, I think, uh, of the program, uh, that there wasn't really much for him to go back to. Um, 
most of these kids, uh, they didn't see playing back home in Africa as success. Uh, I mean, the best players in most leagues in Africa are earning a few hundred dollars a month, um, which you think about that compared to what a player will earn playing in, you know, even the most low tier European league. It's just absolutely nothing. So all of them want to travel. In fact, that's why one of the reasons why I called the book The Away Game is because that's how they view it. They all want to get away. They all want to get to Europe and play. And so when they get back, they don't necessarily want to play in Africa. Or if, it, or if soccer just doesn't work out for them at all, they don't really have much to fall back on because you know, although they went to school during the academy, education really wasn't a focus for most of them. Um, they admitted themselves that they would use class time to sleep because they were tired from training. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, they, they, again, they really struggled trying to find a new way forward. And, and, and this isn't necessarily just a problem with this program. I mean, a lot of academies around the world, the kids don't really focus on a plan B enough um, because they all think they're going to be the ones who make it. And, and you, you have to have that self-belief if you're going to get through a process that is as competitive as it is to make it in <clears throat> professional soccer. But the reality is only a small percentage of them would make it. And so a lot of them, yeah, they struggle to, to figure out a plan B once it doesn't happen for them. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. The book sounds fascinating. Um, and really uh, looking forward to reading it. Um, so my question. So what do you think about the state of African youth soccer? You compare the talent in Africa to the talent in South America or Europe. Do you think the talent's at equal levels? And do you think that there is a gap in the players making it to Europe? Is it mm -hmm. the scouting? Is it, or what point in the pipeline does it break down? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, the raw talent is definitely there, no doubt about it. It's as good as anything you'll find anywhere, South America, anywhere else. Where, where the gap is in the, the development system um, for both identifying and developing young soccer talent, they don't have and ha haven't historically had the academy infrastructure that you would see in Europe. Um, and, and the club teams haven't historically focused on players much younger than sort of 15, 16. Um, you're starting to see that change now with some academies that have sprouted in the last sort of 10 years. Um, uh, one academy in particular called Right to Dream in Ghana um, is having good success, and there's others that have started in that same mold. And so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons Pele famously predicted in 1977 that uh, an African country win the, would win the World Cup by 2000. And that hasn't happened. The, the farthest an African team has gotten is the quarterfinals. And I think a big problem is that. Um, uh, the problem of the lack of youth development, uh, again, because at least officially players aren't supposed to be going to Europe until they're 18. There needs to be a good development infrastructure for them to succeed in Europe once they reach the age of 18, and that hasn't existed. I think, you know, as you, as you have with a lot of different sectors in, in Africa, not just soccer, you know, lack of resources and corruption is a big problem as well. You know, you, you often see teams get to the World Cup from Africa and then players are boycotting because they're not getting paid what they promised. Um, and it can just be real mayhem. And it can impact their performance uh, you know, on the world stage. And so that's been a big problem as well. So um, I think I'm one of the 99.5. Um, I played international soccer as a kid, played mm -hmm. in the Cup. Um, one of the question I have is, when you go through the evaluation process, where there's 5 million kids through the years, a lot of the tools that we have and metrics and everybody at Google knows about metrics are about the physical, right? So the drone stuff's already there. We've already got the heart rate monitors we've got already. But in in my own experience, I'm still involved here. I coach at Ironbound and, and, and um, the difference can sometimes be emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Was there any part of the process through that kind of vast number of kids that actually looked at that or was the focus purely on the physical? So in this program, they didn't focus on emotional intelligence or personality in any structured way. Um, it was a more informal thing of spending time with the kids. But there are attempts at some of the top academies to look at emotional intelligence and personality. And so, um, for example, at Manchester City, 
they have, you know, there's a woman named Carol Zweck who was at Stanford um, who did a lot of research on what she called the growth mindset in children. Sort of basically, what, does a child have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? Growth mindset means that you don't think your abilities are sort of fixed in stone. You think you can develop them with hard work over time. And she's found that kids with a growth mindset tend to do better in school, tend to have better jobs, have better outcomes. And so they actually have a test at, at Manchester City when they've been testing kids for growth mindset. Now it's early days. They say they've had some success in seeing a correlation between players who are shown from this test to have a growth mindset and the ones who um, succeed in the academy. So that's, that's one attempt. There have been attempts by researchers to uh, look at a much sort of broader array of personality variables to try and figure out um, what impact they have on player success. And they've been able to, to identify a bunch of different variables that have an impact on success, but any one of them only measures kind of one to two percent. And so personality is such a complex thing um, that I don't think they've been able to isolate uh, one part of emotional intelligence that's going to really tell them whether a kid's going to make it. But there was another interesting study that was done in Australia where they looked at grit. You know, grit's another one of these personality traits that's been shown not just in soccer but uh, in a lot of other facets in life that grittier kids tend to, to succeed. And they found that with, with players, that the grittier players tend to play more when they're young, they tend to acquire more game intelligence and tend to be more successful. But again, it's just one component of, of personality. Now maybe as you know, things like advanced brain imaging and things like that become more powerful, they'll be able to isolate it in a way that's actually more useful for decision making. But I think right now they, they, they haven't been able to do it in a way that's quantitative enough for, for them to really kind of use it as a filter for these kids. I think that the coaches still think the best way to do it is just spend time with a kid and see how they react to failure, see how they react to, to difficult situations on and off the field and, and go by that. So there's no immediate impact to the NFL draft anytime soon? <laughs> I don't think so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. So I have actually two questions. One is, um, so it sounds like you don't think this Qatar Endeavor experiment was a full success, or it could have been a bigger success. So the first question is, what do you think that Qatar got wrong? And for example, would the same Endeavor have been more successful if it was conducted, say, in a European country, right? Um, and the second question is, if you can comment on um, uh, you know, doping, is there any doping at these ages? Do you have any, like, is it, you know, what's, what's the part of kind of, you know, chemical supplements in this part of the picture, you know, for, does it come in into these early ages? Is, is it, you know, coming into the picture later? If you can comment on this. Yeah, so I'll take the second question first. I don't, I don't think doping is a, an issue, um, at least with this kind of youth scouting in Africa. It's not, at least I never heard of it. I don't think there would be really the resources to do a sort of sophisticated doping program. Anyways, um, in terms of the first question, I think they got a couple things wrong. I think one, the age issue uh, is a big one. Uh, and I focus on the players at the beginning of the program that they found. I'm not actually sure how much better they got over time. Uh, it, it may be that they got much better over time at, at determining players' ages, but at least in terms of the ones I focused on, I think that was uh, a big handicap for them because, again, if, if you're not picking kids who are the age you think they are, then they're not as good as you think they are. And they may, it doesn't necessarily mean they won't succeed, but it means that there's a smaller probability that they're going to succeed. I think the other thing that if I were designing a program like this and your outcome was really just, or your, your goal was really just to produce star players, they should have taken more than 20 every year. Um, they should have maybe spent less money on like sending the kids to Europe to play and to Qatar to go train at the academy there and um, just take more kids into the program. Because if you talk to sports scientists, they're often quite critical of talent identification at a young age in soccer because it's so difficult to choose which players have the potential. Um, that they say that it's better to keep as many kids in the system as possible for a long period of time so that they can weed them out over time. 
And there's been some interesting research on the German youth national team where they found that uh, on average every year there's about 40% turnover in the German youth national team. So that shows you that there's a lot of changing opinions about which players they think are the best players. They also found that the younger you make it on the team, the lower your probability that you make it to the senior team. And so the kids who they think the best uh, over time are going to change. And so the only way to really deal with that is to have more kids in the system and to let them be weeded out over time. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Sebastian, thank you for coming. Thanks for having uh, me. We have copies of the away game and Sebastian will be signing at the uh, end. So, great. Thanks. <laughs>